Hello, my name is Alan Trust and I'm a federal bankruptcy judge in Central Islip, New York. I'm also the president of the Eastern District of New York chapter of the Federal Bar Association. Thank you for joining me for an exciting new program brought to you by the FBA and the federal courts of the Eastern District of New York. This program is called The Bench in Your Backyard and it is designed to introduce young students as citizens of the United States to a greater understanding of our third branch of government, our judicial system. These learning modules are part of the efforts of the United States Second Circuit Court of Appeals to enhance civic educations in our schools called Justice for All, Courts and the Community. Through four separate sessions, we hope to provide you with a greater understanding of the American federal justice system. You will hear from a number of federal judges who will talk about the functions of the federal courts, key constitutional amendments, the significance of an independent judiciary, our jury system, and the vital importance of jury service. In addition, other important members of our courthouse family will describe their roles in the justice system, including a federal prosecutor, a federal defense attorney, an FBI agent, and representatives from the probation and pretrial services. Finally, in celebration of Constitution Day, which is on September 17th, you will learn about how people born in other countries become American citizens, and you will have an opportunity to watch a ceremony where these citizens are sworn in in what we call a naturalization ceremony. We hope that you enjoy the time you spend with our judges and court family. My thanks to each of them and to the members of the FBA who have worked so hard on this project. Again, thank you for taking time to increase your knowledge of the federal courts in your backyard and the critical roles we each play as good citizens. It is my pleasure today to introduce to you Second Circuit Court of Appeals Judge Joseph Bianco. Judge Bianco joined the Second Circuit in 2019 after serving as a federal district judge in the Eastern District of New York for 13 years. Judge Bianco graduated in 1988 from Georgetown University and earned his law degree in 1991 from Columbia Law School, where he was selected for the Law Review. After law school, he had a distinguished career as a lawyer, including many years as a federal prosecutor with the United States Attorney's Office in the Southern District of New York, where he became deputy chief and then chief of the Organized Crime and Terrorism Unit. Judge Bianco also served in the Department of Justice in Washington, D.C., and was appointed as a Deputy Assistant Attorney General in the Criminal Division and supervised the Counterterrorism Section, the Fraud Section, the Appellate Section, and the Capital Case Unit. Judge Bianco has also taught law courses at Fordham Law School, Hofstra Law School, Toro Law School, and St. John's University School of Law, where he continues to teach. Please welcome Judge Bianco. Good morning, I'm Judge Joseph Bianco and I'm delighted to be with you today. During this week, as we celebrate Constitution Day, I wanna give you, by the magic of the internet, what I hope will be an interesting, behind the scenes look at your federal court system. I'm sitting right now in my courtroom in the Federal District Court for the Eastern District of New York in Central Islip. This beautiful courthouse is the third largest federal courthouse in the nation. It is, the one, it is one of two courthouses in the Eastern District of New York, which is one federal district that includes Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, and Nassau and Suffolk counties. The other federal courthouse in this district is in Brooklyn at the base of the Brooklyn Bridge. Although it is quiet in this courtroom right now, make no mistake about it. This courtroom is an extremely busy and important place, a place dedicated to the pursuit of justice. It is in these very courtrooms that the most important matters in the lives of individuals get decided every day. The stakes are often very high. Whether a person is going to go to jail for many, many years, or maybe for the rest of his life, or whether they're gonna walk through those doors to instant freedom with their family. The intensity of trials can be incredible. In civil cases, often people's jobs, their homes, or millions and millions of dollars in damages are on the line. Many of these cases are also critical to the community, cases involving the environment, elections, schools, 
or other important institutions in our society. On any given day, a federal judge has no idea what new criminal or civil case may be filed in the court and come across his or her docket. On the criminal side, the charges can involve gangs, drug distribution, guns, massive fraud schemes, and all the other crimes that unfortunately exist in our society. The civil cases, usually involving money damages, can involve everything from discrimination cases to cases involving alleged violations of a person's constitutional rights to all the other cases that implicate a federal law. For example, I've had federal trademark cases ranging from cases involving claims of knockoff, fake, angry birds being sold on Long Island and put into crane games to a case involving Taylor Swift, where Ms. Swift was sued for allegedly using the name Swift Life on her new app, a name which a Long Island business owner claimed he had registered for his computer business, also called Swift Life. This is the exciting, interesting, and important daily work of our federal court system. And each person has a key role to play. The trial participants, like the judge, the lawyers, the witnesses, and the jury, and the court personnel who support the proceedings, like the interpreters who translate, the U.S. Marshals who protect the courtroom, the court stenographers who keep a record of the proceedings, and on and on and on. Each person has to work hard to do their job to the best of their ability for the system to succeed and to thrive. And our founding fathers knew how important this third co-equal branch of government would be for our democracy to flourish and for our for freedoms and our liberties to be protected. So when they were drafting the United States Constitution, our founding fathers had to decide how we, the people, would create a court system that would be the fair and impartial system that we need, a system of equal justice under the law for all litigants and for our society. In forming our nation, the framers had many tough fundamental questions about the court system to resolve. Who's going to pick the judges? How do you make sure we're going to have good judges? How long will those judges serve for? Who's going to decide whether a person is guilty or not guilty? What are the rules going to be for a trial? These and so many other unanswered questions were confronting the founders at the Constitutional Convention in the late 1700s, and the future of our nation literally hung in the balance. It was decision time. Let's take a few minutes together today to look at what their answers to those critical questions were and to examine how well the Founding Fathers did in building a court system in 1789 that would stand the test of time, now over 230 years later. You be the judge. The Founding Fathers created the federal court system in Article Three of the Constitution. And as they drafted this key document that would be the foundation of our new nation, they wanted fairness and justice to be the cornerstones of our judicial system. In fact, they engraved many basic legal rules in the very language of the Constitution itself, including the Bill of Rights, to ensure that these principles would guide our courts. And over two centuries later, those same rules are at work in the courtrooms across America every single day and continue to guide each case, whether that case is in Alaska or Alabama, whether the litigant is homeless or is a millionaire, no matter their walk of life. And as we celebrate Constitution Day, I wanna take just a few minutes to focus upon some of these constitutional principles and rules that are so important to our judicial system and to our democracy. First, our founding fathers wanted to make sure that our federal courts would be filled with fair and impartial judges who were completely independent from the other branches of government and would not be swayed by political pressure or the popular will, but would follow the law no matter what. 
So in the Constitution, the founders made clear that federal judges would be appointed by the President of the United States, not elected by the people, like the members of the other two branches of government, and the judges would not have fixed terms in office and have to worry that they might be fired or replaced based upon their decisions. Instead, the judges would be appointed for a life. So when I make a decision as a judge, I don't have to worry about being voted out of office or being fired by the president or being replaced by some future president. I can follow the law without fear or favor. And to make sure that we have qualified and ethical judges, the founding fathers also wrote in the Constitution that the United States Senate would have to approve the president's selection. We know that this constitutional provision that's in Article II is part of our system of checks and balances. The Senate approval process is a check on the president's power to appoint. I have personally lived out this constitutional process two times. In 2005, I went down to the White House and was interviewed by President George W. Bush's top lawyers for a vacancy, an opening, on the federal district court here in Central Iceland. I was pretty nervous, to say the least. A few months after the interview, I was so happy to learn that President Bush was nominating me to be a federal district judge. But I wasn't a judge yet. I had to go down to the United States Capitol and have my Senate hearing in which before voting on my nomination, the senators can review my personal and professional experiences and ask questions to make sure that I am qualified for this very important job. That was a big day in my life. My whole family came to hear that hearing. I had the support of our two home state senators at the time, Senator Charles Schumer and Senator Hillary Clinton. I was unanimously approved by the Senate and had the honor of being a federal district judge for over a decade. But then something very unexpected happened. In 2018, after interviewing at the White House again, I was so fortunate to be nominated by President Donald Trump to serve on the United States Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit, which hears appeals from federal district courts in New York, in Connecticut, and in Vermont. That is the second level of the federal court system, with the highest level, of course, being the United States Supreme Court in Washington, D.C. And so, since my confirmation to the Second Circuit in 2019, I've had the wonderful opportunity to serve on the Court of Appeals, although I've also continued to provide, preside over some of my remaining district court cases in this courtroom. I consider it an enormous privilege and also a daunting responsibility to serve the public as a federal judge at any level. In fact, before you become a federal judge, there is a formal induction ceremony where you take the oath to follow the Constitution and laws of the United States in a fair and impartial manner as you administer the laws with equal justice to all. I follow that solemn oath every single day. Repeat after me. I, Joseph Frank Bianco, do solemnly swear. I, Joseph Frank Bianco, do solemnly swear. That I will administer justice without respect to persons. That I will administer justice without respect to persons. And do equal right to the poor and to the rich. And do equal right to the poor and to the rich. That I will faithfully and impartially discharge. That I will faithfully and impartially discharge. And perform. And perform. All the duties all the duties incumbent upon me incumbent upon me as United States Circuit Judge as United States Circuit Judge under the Constitution under the Constitution and laws of the United States and laws of the United States and that I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States and I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies foreign and domestic against all enemies foreign and domestic that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same that I will bear true faith and allegiance to the same that I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. That I will well and faithfully discharge. That I will well and faithfully discharge. The duties of the office. The duties of the office. On which I am about to enter. On which I am about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations.
This whole system in our Constitution for selecting and confirming federal judges was designed by our founding fathers to make judicial independence with fair and impartial judges a foundation of our justice system. But the founding fathers had to make sure not only that the judges were fair and impartial, but that the rules within our court system would also be fair and produce a just result. They didn't want a system that would allow innocent people to be convicted or the cards to be stacked in favor of one side or the other in any given case. So in our Constitution, there are many rules that are designed to accomplish that vision of our founders. And those rules are part of every trial in this courtroom. You know many of these rules, not only from television and movies, but also because they are so fundamental to our society and our culture. The Constitution states in the Sixth Amendment that innocence or guilt will be decided by, by the jury, not by an unelected judge, and it must take place in a public courtroom. Twelve people from the community sit in this jury box, hear the evidence, and decide whether the defendant is guilty. All 12 people have to agree unanimously for a defendant to be found guilty. You someday might be called to serve as a juror and have that awesome civic responsibility as a citizen of carefully weighing the evidence in a trial with a person's freedom in your hands. And to further ensure that it'll be a fair trial, the defendant is entitled to an attorney, and I'll appoint attorney for free if the defendant can't afford one. The witnesses also are required to come into the courtroom in person, take an oath to tell the truth in the witness box, and the Constitution states that the defense lawyer must then have the right to cross-examine the witnesses, because we know that that will help the jury decide whether each witness is lying or telling the truth. And the Fifth Amendment states the defendant is entitled to due process during the trial and the right to remain silent and not incriminate himself. The Supreme Court has made clear that due process also includes the presumption of innocence. The jury is told that the defendant sitting in this courtroom though he has been arrested and charged with a crime, is presumed innocent, and he does not have to testify or prove that he is innocent. Instead, the government has to prove his guilt beyond a reasonable doubt before he can be found guilty, which we know is an extremely high standard. That burden rests at that table, the prosecution table, at all times the right to a jury trial, the right to remain silent, the right to confront your accusers, the burden of proof. These rights are only the beginning of the rights that the framers saw as essential to the judicial system. If you decide to go to law school someday, you will learn about all the other rights enshrined in the laws to ensure that both sides in every case are receiving due process and equal justice under the law. Having been a judge for almost 15 years now, I can tell you how amazing it is to me to watch all of these constitutional safeguards and other similar rules and procedures come alive and work together in this courtroom to help us do our best as a society to make sure that our justice system is fair, impartial, and just in every single case. I hope I've been able to give you a basic understanding of what our founding fathers were hoping to achieve in creating the federal court system. As a result of their efforts, as well as changes and improvements to our laws over the years, I believe we have the best justice system in the entire world. Many countries have justice systems that are riddled with corruption and lack even the most basic elements of fairness and due process. Ours is a constitutional system envisioned by our founders that we can all be very proud of. But we also know that our justice system is not perfect. We know that mistakes are made by juries and by judges. When we find those mistakes, we can and must correct them. And then 
we should look at ways to improve our rules and procedures to avoid those mistakes in the future. We know that our system can be more fair, more just, and more equal, and we should all be dedicated as judges, as lawyers, and as citizens to always improve our judicial system. Sometimes that is accomplished from the inside by those involved in some aspect of the justice system. And maybe some of you may decide to be lawyers or pursue another job in the justice system someday. You'll be hearing from some of those other important court participants in another video. But those voices can also come from people who are not lawyers or judges and don't have any career in the legal profession, but they've dedicated themselves to these principles of fairness, equality, and justice, each in their own individual way. Out here in Central Iceland, we have one week summer camp at the courthouse where high school students from all over Long Island learn in an exciting and interactive way about the court system. They hear from an all-star cast of participants in our justice system. They compete in a moot court competition and they watch the swearing in of new citizens in a naturalization ceremony in this ceremonial courtroom. In that ceremony, we welcome with open arms immigrants from so many other nations across the globe as they take the oath of citizenship in this courtroom and pledge allegiance to our Constitution with big smiles and often tears of joy streaming from their eyes as they instantly receive all the freedoms and protections and guarantees of the Constitution and the laws of the United States that are guaranteed to every citizen from sea to shining sea. The students in the camp who have witnessed that moving ceremony in this courtroom, I am sure, will never forget it. Maybe you can participate in our camp in the coming years and see it for yourself. But later this week, you can participate in such a ceremony by video. Our time is ending, but I wanted to leave you with this final thought. On the last day of the camp each year, we try to let the students hear from an inspiring speaker who has dedicated his or her life to the pursuit of fairness and justice. Over the years, the students have met people like Mary Beth Tinker, who in 1965, as a 13-year-old junior high school student in Des Moines, Iowa, wanted to wear a black armband to school to protest and silence the Vietnam War. When her school told her no, she filed a lawsuit arguing that the school was violating her First Amendment rights and her case went all the way up to the Supreme Court where she was victorious. That case, Tinker v. Des Moines, continues to be a landmark Supreme Court decision on the First Amendment to this day. And Ms. Tinker travels the nation speaking to students, including at our camp, to emphasize the importance of being engaged in society and taking action in a civilized way when you see something that you believe is wrong. One year, the students also met Nell Stokes, who as a 16-year-old participated in the famous Montgomery bus boycott as she and others protested segregated seating on city buses in Alabama. And then she dedicated her career to advocating for civil rights. The students also met Mishu Salador, who spoke about how during World War II, Japanese Americans were unjustly detained in internment camps in the United States. And as an 18-year-old nursing student at that time in history, she was pulled away from college in Oregon and separated from her family for three years in one of those camps. She explained how she overcame that experience to succeed in our nation and dedicated her life to public service as a school teacher here on Long Island. They also met Kristen Fleshner, who's blind and yet graduated from Harvard Law School and has now dedicated her exceptional legal skills to advocating for the disabled. And she's also training for the upcoming Paralympics in Tokyo. The students also loved Kristen's service dog, Zoe. And one year, the students even met United States Supreme Court Justice Sonia Sotomayor, who talked about overcoming adversity in her own life as she was raised in the housing projects in the Bronx by her mother. Her father died when she was nine years old 
and she has battled type 1 diabetes her whole life. But she battled, she worked hard, and overcame these and other obstacles she faced in life to ultimately rise to be a justice on the highest court in the land. And as we celebrate this Constitution Day, these opportunities are available to each one of you to work as hard as you can in school, no matter what the circumstances are, to find out what you are passionate about, pursue it with all your heart each day, and then watch your world light up as you impact those around you, you impact your community, and impact our nation in such wonderful ways that you cannot possibly even imagine. Thank you for listening, and good luck on your journey.